This is a Momentum Media production. Nerd alert! Property Nerds, <laughs> the home for data-driven property investors, where we uncover Australia's hot and cold markets, latest headlines and trends. G'day everyone and welcome to another episode of The Property Nerds. I'm here dialing in from New Zealand with Lee and it's the month of May, which is a special month for us for many reasons. We actually travel back home to New Zealand every May and use it as a time to spend with family, uh, go check out places that we grew up and enjoyed growing up, cafes, you know, special walks, all that sort of stuff, both Wellingtonians, so that's where we're from. And also get to, you know, have a few, I guess, family moments as well that we like in terms of, you know, just being able to spend time with people in the mornings where that time zone difference helps a lot. If you haven't already done it, I totally recommend it. Imagine waking up 5 a.m., which is what I do every day and being able to know that it's 3 a.m. back in Sydney or Melbourne, which means that you won't have your laptop go crazy or emails go crazy until about 10 a.m., 10.30 New Zealand time. So that's what we've been enjoying. What have we been using that for? Steps, walks, coffees, strategy, reflection, end of financial year planning and goals. I think there's about three places in the world that allows that from your sort of Southeast areas. And that's the Pacific Islands, uh, New Zealand. And if you want to go hang out with some penguins, then obviously Antarctica. So those are the three areas. It's very, very few countries in the world that do that. But that's what happens in May for us. And we try and do that once a year as part of a living lifestyle by design, right? So and of course, I'm here as well. I mentioned before with Lee. How are you, Lee? Good. Very good. We're enjoying Wellington. And it's actually not that cold here, which is very rare. Surprising. It was a lot colder in Sydney before we left and touched down. And we we're looking out at a sunny day today out in Wellington. So yeah, it's been great. It's been very special here so far. And we've been averaging some killer steps. Usually like we're on the laptops, the office, and it's what, three to 5,000 a day, sometimes five to six when I'm conscious about it. But we've been cracking the nine, 10 plus a day, which has been pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Averaging nine to 10 plus, which has been really, really good. But also there was some very big success that you guys achieved at Investicate for the month of May. And so It was actually on your birthday, 4th of May, was the Real Estate Business Awards, which is the prestigious awards of all the real estate in Australia, I would say. And you guys came out on top for Buyers Agency of the Year 2023. Yeah, it was uh, very, very special. And to be on the birthday night was unreal. We had such a fun night. I think the team had enough of collecting silver finalist badges (laughs) each year and We were just. You came through with the gold. It came through with the gold, and we're very, very grateful for it. So, for everyone, by the way, tuning into the show, thank you for all the love, the support, the messages, the reviews, the you know, deciding to work with us, or even just having a chat with us at Investigate Buyers Agency. We are officially the 2023 Buyers Agency of the Year in Australia. And uh, no, look, I'm very grateful for that, Lee. That couldn't have done it without our team. Um, We've got you know over 20 at Investigate who played an immense immense part of all of that happening. And with regards to our clients, this is all you. Thank you so much for letting us support you on your journey and helping you scale the portfolio to new heights. And can't wait to see where we take it over the rest of this year and hopefully can come back and go back to back in 2024. But no, look, super, super stoked. And if you're tuning into this podcast and you'd like to have the buyer's agency of the year on your team, look, please reach out, investikit.com.au and have a free initial consultation with us. And I personally look forward to supporting you. In terms of the month of May, there's obviously been some interesting learnings from last April, Lee. What's been cracking on the finance front? Yeah. So finance updates. There has been a few updates since last couple months. Um, So essentially, April, there was a pause, as we're all aware, at long last on the RBA cash rate from the uh, cash rate increases with no further movement. So that would have been 11 consecutive cash rate increases in a row for those prior months to that. And so May, beginning of this month, there was an unexpected movement after we had finally hit that pause, only to have an additional 0.25% cash rate increase for this month announced. So RBA cash rate off the back of this recent increase is now currently at 3.85%. And so essentially most lenders would have applied the 0.25% and increase to their variable rate now. However, if not, they would be applied definitely within the next week. So that was one part that we didn't get to cover off last month. 
Well, on that note, it's, in my opinion, the silliest decision ever by the RBA because there was just all the data sets moving in that right direction of the cash rate, which is the inflation sets that drive the decisions. Yes, there was one data set, which was the rental that is yet to feed into inflation. And as a result, those rental increases based on trajectories will make that number obviously play a bigger part. But in saying that, there has to be a moment where we pause, take stock, and just see the flow on impacts of the economy, flow on impacts of jobs. Like we're already operating of delayed data. And mm-hmm. also we're already, you know, having one pause and not even giving it a moment to sink in. I understand that inflation is well above where it should be, but trajectory has to be considered as well in that balancing soft versus harder landings. Now, in the interim, there still are no major cracks showing. But there are some smaller cracks starting to show in some delinquencies amongst more of our rougher lenders, uh, Pepper, Latrobe, uh, Liberty, Resimac, First Mac. We're seeing some uptick in some delinquency rates there. Still operating at very, very low bases. But what that just means is that it's getting tough for many people. And it needs to be considered in a more holistic environment now and giving that pause to consider. It's not a small amount like the change that we've had, and it just further solidifies my theory that we may see the same things that we've seen the last few cycles of interest rate increases over the last 30, 40 years, which is hard increases, hard decreases. So I'm still living by that opinion, which is that we will see some heavy decreases, whether it be tail end of this year or next year. It's just inevitable when we increase at this rate in this fashion, likely the whole break accelerating analogy on cars. You break this hard, you're going to then pop off, come to a complete stop and have to get cracking and going again. So that's my thoughts on the rates, but TBC, and obviously we're starting to see some things change, Lee, on the interest rates component because banks are playing around with a few things on their end. What are you seeing from how banks are responding to a few different things, both regarding their margins as well as you know offers and way to look at lending at this stage? Yeah. So in the last week, banks have started to pull away from cashbacks for new refinance applications from external lenders. So this is a big thing. So one of the major banks being CBA is no longer providing cashbacks as of the 1st of June. And so what they would look like is to apply by the 31st of May in order to have your loan applied for before that cutoff date, but also you'd then need to have your loan settled by the 30th of September, 2023. So that's one of the guidelines that they've put out. So they're the first major to come out. There's two other smaller lenders, Ubank and My State, who have pulled out of the cashbacks also, finishing end of March and April. And then NAB has now followed to finish their cashback offering as of the end of June. So Lee, with that, what do you reckon the pros and the cons are from these cashbacks changing? Yeah, so the pros would be this should stop banks from having so many refinances all the time. There's been a lot of like clients jumping from bank to bank for a slightly good rate for a two to five K cash back constantly. And that could be every six months, one year, and so on. So that would be a pro. Another pro with this in turn would also give them greater margins, the banks, to start bringing down their interest rates. So obviously they're not forking out up to five grand per for a loan being refinanced now. And so that should allow them to yeah, bring that down. On the other side though, cons. So those who are coming off their fixed rates are now not going to be able to nullify their expenses as easy as they would have been able to before. So, you know, quite often in the refinance space with clients that we look after, we'll quite often weigh up if it's the worthwhile uh, stopping their fixed rate or quitting their fixed rate a month or two earlier in order to get them in onto a better deal ASAP, the cashback would nullify that expense of any early fixed, early repayment adjustment costs for that fixed rate loan that they would be on so they can keep moving forward with the additional lending or whichever they may, may need it in that scenario. So that's gone once cashbacks leave. The other thing is, is another thing that a con could be is that this won't you know, if the banks don't make rates better and they're already making such a decent profit, they're making record profits since having all these refinances going through, they're now also going to have increased margins, which only, you know, will only 
increase if they're no longer taking on the expense to provide the cashback for refinances on top of that? Well, big, big changes on that front. And I remember the the golden days of Westpac throwing cashbacks at a two to three K per property. Ridiculous, right? Per property. Now there were people getting cashbacks of eight, ten, twelve thousand dollars massive. Now, Lee, that's not the only change the lenders are seeing. There's also been fixed rate changes. What are you seeing on the fixed rate fronts that are starting to happen? So some lenders are now slowly, slightly dropping their fixed. I say slightly because it's not major, major change in the fixed rate space. It's an indication though, if they're slightly dropping that, quite often the trend is that a bank will start offering what seems to be enticing and fixed rates in comparison to where the market is currently before they actually start making the major drops in their fixed rates. So, you know, that's important to know. Like if you are seeing fixed rates that are looking attractive right now in the market, I would be, you know, it would be worthwhile taking advantage of a one-year fixed rate, for example, because these low rates are already indication that the variable rates are going to start dropping sometime in the near future. That would be my tip on that. Definitely. And with regards to rates, Lee, I do want to make a call out on one thing. Your business, Hills Finance, has been getting huge levels of inquiry for this unique product that you've been working on, and it's called Dollar for Dollar Refinances. Now, just to bring everyone up to speed, there are things where people are looking at their finances and going, look, I pay my repayments on time. I have a large amount of equity or healthy amount of equity. So I'm not too close to that value versus loan red line. And lastly, I just don't feel I'm getting a good amount of interest rates. And also, I'm stuck with my borrowing capacity, which is not letting me move banks just because all these policies have changed. Even though I'm paying it off well, I'm paying it on time, and I have a good loan to value ratio. So in these scenarios, it's in your advantage to try and look for a better deal so you can refinance but also ensuring that you have someone treat you for this way of looking at your home loans, which is, hey, you pay them on time, you have a good amount of equity in there, so we trust that we can cover this for you. And in that case, this is where dollar for dollar refinance comes through, which is where you're not lending it and asking for more money, just lending what you owe now, pending the interest rate obviously be better than where you're at now, pending that you're doing this because you might be a little bit stuck of where things are at, And obviously, you have a good amount of equity in the portfolio. So it's getting you unstuck and getting you a better deal. Lee, could you tell us a little bit about the more particulars of this? So if anyone is looking to reach out on this, because it's been very popular, how can people reach out to you during these times to help people in the higher interest rate environment? Uh, Best way to reach out to Hills Finance is hillfinance.com.au forward slash contact. And there's a form that you can fill out and we'll give you a call. That would be the best way. Um, Specifics of dollar for dollar refinance is the, uh, the specifics for dollar for dollar refinance is firstly, having your loan with the same provider for 12 months or more. So this is not for people who have just recently settled their loan. This is for people who have had great repayment history for 12 months or more with their loan with their current provider. It's really good for people who have had to go to your third tier type lenders. Okay. So if you're sitting with a Pepper, a Liberty, a Latrobe, or you're sitting in the hovering around the sevens for your interest rates, this product is a very good offering for you. And quite often with all these rate increases. You know, it's over 35% in, uh, decrease in borrowing capacity. You are in somewhat of a mortgage jail and you can't move from that lender. This is a great option for you. So 12 months, good repayment history, a credit score of 600 or more, consistent employment for the last three to six months. Whilst they want to know your employment, they don't actually want to look at your borrowing capacity, so to speak, because we're not taking on additional debts. We're recasting and refinancing your existing debt. And the other thing is, keeping on the same repayment type. So if you're already on interest only and you know you're going to come off shortly and you want to maintain interest only repayments, you'd want to get onto this ASAP before you come off the interest only term. Because once you switch to principal and interest, this type of product, they would want to make sure they're refinancing for exactly the same repayment type. So that's an important thing to note as well. Thanks for the tips there, Lisa. That's the dollar for dollar refinancing, unlocking the ability to have more flexibility in who you're with 
improving your interest rate during these high interest rate periods, and just making sure that you're better looked after for your good repayment history, good equity, and your position, rather than all these crazy rule changes, interest rates increasing, making the borrowing capacities lower. This is just a way to better your household position. So reach out to Lee and the team at Hills Finance if you'd like to have a chat. Now, on the finance side, Lee, how are trends looking right now from a national finance data? Because as we all know, finance leads the way to property. Yeah. And as you mentioned before, it's delayed data. So this is all data in the lending indicators as of March 2023. So the value of new loan commitments for total housing has rose to 4.9% to $24 billion after a fall of 1% in February. And so while this was the first monthly rise since January 2022, it remained 26.3% lower compared to one year ago. So that's total housing. For owner-occupied housing, this rose to 5.5% or by 5.5% to $16 billion. And that was 24.8% lower compared to a year ago. And then for investor housing, this rose 3.7% to $8 billion. And that was 29.2% lower compared to a year ago. That's a, now, on the lending front, Lee, those changes are interesting because there's two core things that people should really pick out from this March ending data. Number one is finance is actually rising now. And interest rates haven't come down yet. They're still way higher than they were this time last year. And finance has bottomed and it's starting to rise based on these indicators. And it's rising both in investors who are obviously taking advantage of you know, the tides that might be changing in many cities, especially as you can see some of our bigger markets that drive these numbers, they're changing. And owner occupiers, first home buyers have obviously played a key part and owner occupiers now seeing that rise is definitely important. I think there's a bit of a sugar hit for those first home buyers in New South Wales trying to get in pre end of financial year. That's definitely something we've seen on that 1.5 million balance and, and lower on that liberal policy. And so I think that as that phases out, we'll see a big run on that finance for what's possible in that New South Wales area. Now, the second and most important thing, this is called net finance or net trends. And this is something important to consider. Finance is, yes, nationally 26.3% for total dollars, lower than this time one year ago. We are now one year ago from that sort of interest rate increasing trend, which definitely means that we have seen firstly a borrowing capacity shift of about 38%. Yet finance numbers are down 26%, which means there's a net improvement there because that difference is about 12%. So that means there's still actually more demand relative to the supply of credit. It's just that the fact is the supply of credit is tight and hence we're in that lower finance position, which means there's still a lot of heat in that market. It's just the fact that that heat in that market is actually A, rising now, but still in net terms better than the borrowing capacity shift. Whereas if we saw a 38% borrowing capacity decline and finance trends were say down 40%, that would be not only a finance factor, but other weaker factors making an overall shift. So this means there are some green shoots in comparison to just that isolated finance side of the equation in housing that is pulling the markets back in terms of how much money is floating around in Australia. Now, on that note, we've actually been understanding these borrowing capacity trends and looking at research in a different way and trying to understand where that audience is looking at property prices in the sub 500k, we've released our latest research paper. So on the latest research paper at Investicket, it's unlocking Queensland's hidden gems, which is the top four high growth regions under 500k. So in the past, Lee, me and you've gone through a bit of a Q&A, and I guess I'll hand over back to you to figure out, hey, what, what you'd like to know from me on our latest research paper. Yeah, um, so this was released in May, this one. So again, if you want to go to investikit.com.au forward slash white papers, you'll be able to see all the recent papers there. Again, this one is called Unlocking Queensland's Hidden Gems, Top 4 High Growth Regions Under 500K. So Arjun, firstly, why did you pick 500K as the budget for the white paper that you base this off? And why are they hidden gems? Yeah, good question. So I think the 500K was selected for three reasons. Number one is there has been a huge shift in median pricing. And when you look at median pricing, that middle 
right, becomes lower when a lot of people operate at lower price points. And that's what's happening in Australia. A lot of people are actually operating at lower price points, which in summary means prices are not declining as much as people think. There's been a shift in buyer appetite to actually buy cheaper properties, which drags median pricing down. The second reason is the borrowing capacity declines are placing a huge focus on you know, the affordable price points, the 38% declines in borrowing capacities as an average is massive. And if you think about it, that sort of six to 800K pricing is now, you know, 350 to 550 for many people in that range. So that's something that's become popular. We're seeing it in our business as well. The inquiries of that sort of 350 to 550 are far greater than they've ever been. Because of affordability. Definitely. And then the third part is naturally at, at lower price point, rental yields are better. And so people who are trying to find a balance of growth and rental yields want to try and figure out how I can, you know, minimize my cash flow losses because everything is a loss in this environment from a cash flow perspective. And that's the kind of things that we're seeing. Now, as for hidden gems, well, look, there's two things there. That's me getting a little fancy with my writing uh, or the team getting fancy with their writing. And the second thing mainly is that, you know, people often think when you're looking for affordability or looking for growth markets, it needs to be in major cities. And that is not the case at all. Some of the biggest growing markets are some of our affordable cities at this present time. And that's been the case for last year. Now, obviously, our biggest cities are starting to go into recovery action, trying to make up those losses. And hence why those gains have come up a fair bit in recent months, led by the top end. But the hidden gems are more so giving acknowledgement to the markets that people perhaps don't traditionally consider. So before we get to what these hidden gems are, what was the mythology used to pick these regions? Yeah, so the mythology used to pick these regions, right? We firstly looked at the short-term price trends because obviously we don't want these areas to have exploded so massively that you know we have missed every single possible part of it. But look, some of them have, but that was a consideration. The second thing was long-term trends and long-term being 10 years. All these markets in action here, the four in this report, have actually had long-term compound growth rates of 5% per annum or more which is in line with like national averages. And so since they're in line in that 30-year trend, our thinking should be, well, for things to return back to a trend, we also like to see underperformers in the last 10 years because they technically have more legs in them if they were to pick up based on changing environments. And that's the case for some of these areas. Then we obviously looked at the most important piece in this environment right now, which is affordability and serviceability. So we're not thinking affordability just because it's cheap. That's not a fair way to look at it. We're looking at it in line with incomes, interest rates that are high, rent payments, all relative to each other. So it's actually making sense to what the local audience wants. Like, Is it affordable for them? And naturally, then we go into the algorithms, stuff, the machine learning, the AI, all the fun stuff, uh, economic indicators, sales market indicators, rental indicators, and future supply. They've been the same economic indicators and data points that we've used to make some pretty bold predictions over the last few years that have come up. For example, predicting that Adelaide would be the best performing capital city for 2022 and rise double digits on mainstream media, which was on the weekend show. And both those things happened. And we made that call early 2022. And even in the face of many interest rate increases, 10, 11, it still happened for that year. The same algorithms are used to predict Bendigo and Ballarat would be some of the top performers in the pre-COVID era and going into COVID. And that also happened, as well as even going back to regional Tasmania and its boom well before COVID. Also, these were the same indicators used to predict that the declines in Sydney would sustain and continue for 2022. And that when we talked about Sydney's recovery and why six reasons it would recover the start of this year, even without interest rates having to fall, we predicted that using the same algorithms, which In fact, Sydney has been recovering at the start of this year. So I hope I can just share that these are with very high confidence were made and have proven themselves for five years running now that they are extremely accurate and we've had some phenomenal results for ourselves, myself personally, and for clients. Fantastic. And so again, what is the areas and why? Why now? (laughs) Okay. Okay. So the what are the areas? I'm going to be uh, giving some away, but also for the rest of them, I encourage you to download this research report. It's totally free to download and you can get it from investikit.com.au. And we have a, a free section there called research. And then you click on white papers. We've released over a year's worth of research papers. They're often featured on the AFR, Weekend Today, Sunrise, uh, news.com.au, and just some Yahoo Finance as well. Uh, in terms of this research, there were two 
core areas I'm going to give away. One of them being Rockhampton and the second one being Townsville. Uh, these two are some of the highest scoring markets of the four regions. But in terms of these hidden gems and I guess the under 500k in Queensland, the why is quite straightforward. Firstly, we're seeing a big positive shift in their economic environment. Economy is so important to the mix of housing. Just think about it for a second. Jobs, spending, confidence, ability to pay, ability to live, ability to upgrade, buy more household goods, all of these things create a positive environment. And in the face of you know uncertainty in Australia and in the face of increasing interest rates, costs for businesses, these two regions have seen very positive employment and economic shift. So to give you some examples, many people may remember the higher crime, higher unemployment days of Townsville with unemployment reaching 10% plus, which is no joke, everyone. It's huge. And these numbers have rocketed down to below 3% unemployment. In fact, one of the lowest in the country. Also, infrastructure spending per capita. So this is not just looking at the projects and what's there. This is looking at projects relevant to population size, right? Everyone thinks of the big projects that happen in Sydney. Well, guess what? It should be happening. It's a 5 million plus city. We should be seeing big spending. And over here, when we look at it on a per capita basis, the spending is very enhanced in a perspective of Townsville. We're also looking at the local city's economy from GRP, so gross regional product, similar to your GDP in a way, but more, I guess, region focused. And that's been positive in this local area. Job advertisements and more. So that's just one aspect being the economy. Much the same as well on the Rockhampton front. So we've been seeing improved economic conditions with unemployment shooting down. In the December quarter data, it was down to 3.9, high infrastructure spend per capita, and also an increase in GRP too. Now, from a GRP perspective, not as high as, say, Townsville, but improving nonetheless. Economic indicators were just one aspect, but for both of these cities, the cycle of their markets has meant their last 10-year growth has been weak, and therefore, we expect a really solid return to averages, and we expect that to happen over the next three to five years. So things are looking positive. Whilst the markets remain undersupplied, undersupplied in both rent and for sale properties, undersupplied in housing construction, low stock on market, substantially below listings in comparison to pre COVID, rising rents, and most importantly, in a time of high interest rates, local incomes are not stretched for the current prices at present. And from my perspective, they could weather the storm of rising interest rates with a better economy lower supply, and more affordability in comparison to many other cities. Hence why these two cities have been clear standouts, even in these higher interest rate environments. Now, they are two of four. And when it comes to you know the four or the remaining two, I'd encourage you to download and check it out. The other really cool thing, just FYI, when you're looking at the report, you guys have these hexagonal diagrams. We, we call them the spider charts. The spider charts. That's what it's called. And you give each town of these four, four, you know, four gems. They get a rating out of five, one to five, five being the highest rating, which I think is a good way to have a nice snapshot when you're looking at comparison of areas as well. Yeah, we looked at these five or oh, six data points: price pressure, so short-term price growth, growth cycle, the legs in it, rental pressure, how strong rental markets and rents are likely to rise. Rental yield, your return on investment, affordability to local incomes and current high interest rates, and then future supply. So these are the six core factors in it. And obviously, on the more detail, you'll get economic summaries, market data on each of these areas, and some core standouts. So totally free to download. Do check it out. Unlocking the four hidden gems in Queensland under 500K. And uh, I don't expect these to be under 500K for that long. So I would check this out because. Uh, we're extremely bullish on this based on some of the data I'm seeing, and we have every right to be based on the economic changes, under supply, and fast changing prices. They have risen in price, just under double digits for some cities, and over double digits for some of these cities. Over eleven consecutive interest rate rises from 2022 to now 2023, seeing the rises as well. So, investikit.com.au. That's where you can check this out and download the white paper. A lot of very valuable free content. So make sure you guys do that. 
Thanks again, Arjun, for all that research insights. And again, if you guys want to have access to that free report, all you need to do is go to investikit.com.au, click on research, head down to white papers, and you can find all the free info there. Also, just before we wrap up, if you did want to reach out about the dollar for dollar refinance or any other finance topics that I spoke on today, you can reach out to me and the Hills Finance team at hillsfinance.com.au forward slash contact. Thanks, guys, and over and out. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned. Game over.